Happy Good Friday, Water's Edge members, regular attenders, and guests. My name is Eric Reinerts, and I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and I'm going to be leading the service today. Uh, Good Friday is a, a time for remembering Jesus, uh, thanking Jesus, and, and we have made it a time of, of repentance of sins in light of what Jesus has done for us on the cross as well. And so I just want to lay out for you what's going to be happening in our service. I'm going to open us in prayer here in just a minute. And then Dan is going to be leading us in a uh, con contemplative song, uh, What Wondrous Love Is This? Uh, then I'm going to do a reading that I'll tell you a little bit more about. I, I got a reading from uh, Pastor Rick Gamash who is Josh Belinsky's old pastor down in the cities, and he put together a, uh, a rendering of, of Christ's you know, last hours before his death. It's just powerful, so I'm going to read that. I'm going to make a few comments on that. Then after that, we're going to have our, our time of, of, of repentance. And if we were here at the church, we would have our, our big wooden cross up front. We'd have nails and hammers, and we'd be writing down and nailing uh, our sins to the cross, which I'll, I'll say more about in a little bit. But because we're at home, um, we're not going to be able to do that. But we still do want to you know, go through this remember, you know, repentance process as we, as we do every Good Friday. So I would just encourage you right now to go and grab a, a piece of paper, grab something to write with, um, and have everybody that's watching the service with you do the same thing so that you'll be ready to go. And I'll tell you what we're gonna do uh, when the time comes with that piece of paper and, and, and with that pen or pencil. So go ahead and stop your, your video right now. Go grab that stuff and I'll wait for you here. I'll 
I'll sing on, I'll sing on, and through eternity I'll sing. All right, welcome back. You've got your pen, pencil, something to write on. And so now we'll, we'll continue on with the service. Let's, let's start with some prayer. Lord Jesus, I, I just praise you today on Good Friday for having been willing to sacrifice yourself for sinners such as I and others who are watching. God, I just pray that today as we, we remember Jesus, as, as we think about his death on the cross and, and the suffering that he bore for us and what it means for us, I pray that uh, we would be focused. I pray you'd free us from distraction. I pray that we would be able to concentrate on the, on the words of the songs that we sing, uh, on the words of this uh, wonderful story that Pastor Rick has, has written that we're going to read um, that we would be able to, you know, focus on the time of repentance we're going to share, the words of the prayers, and then the words of the closing songs. God, just help us to be tuned in, focused on you. And I just pray that we would just walk with you through, through your death that you died for, for us. And that as a result, we would, we would fall more deeply in love with you. We would, um, have a greater appreciation for and hatred of, of our sin that, that nailed you there, and that we would just uh, rejoice all the more uh, in, in your resurrection Easter Sunday and, and all that that means for us, God. So I pray that you would meet us now, and that you would just, again, keep, keep the devil far from us, help us to focus, and uh, really bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, I want to read you uh, what Pastor Rick Gamash put together here. Just a powerful um, reminder, uh, biblical reminder of what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's called the Father's Cup, a crucifixion narrative. And I would just invite you to, you know, close your eyes and, and listen and just try to picture and smell and touch and feel uh, what Jesus did for us on Good Friday 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> Jesus is bowed and bloody. 110 pounds of lumber is strapped across his shoulders. The weight of the rough wood proves too much as it grinds against the lacerations left by the Roman scourging. Pain explodes like light in Jesus' brain and he crumples under the beam. When he comes to, Jesus feels somehow weightless and he realizes that the wooden crossbeam has been cut from his back. Another man is carrying it now, a dark man whose face he cannot see, but he does see the face of another. Mercifully, a Roman centurion bends and takes Jesus under the arm to lift him gently to his feet again. Jesus looks up and holds the soldier captive in his gaze. The victim's eyes do not pierce the centurion with the hatred he expects. Instead, he finds love in those eyes, love mingled with pain, yes, Broken-hearted love, but love nonetheless. And not a love excited by one mere act of kindness. This love preceded the moment. This love preceded his existence. This love preceded the existence of the world. Somehow the centurion knows that these are the eyes of eternal love. Jesus holds the soldier's gaze as long as he can, but the blood that dripped off the ends of his hair to the ground when he was bent low under the cross now drops into his eyes. The blood mixed with sweat stings and Jesus blinks. By this time Friday, Jesus is familiar with that sting, but it was a new sensation on Thursday night in the garden. There in the garden, he walked with his friends singing hymns and speaking quietly. They passed through the city gate and walked up the hill of Gethsemane through the olive trees. But there were only 11 friends with Jesus, not 12. One of the 12 chosen proved no friend at all. Satan already held Judas, the betrayer, by the hand. And then and now, 
by the hand then, and now he was has him by the neck. Judas hangs pale and gasping, swinging from the end of his belt under the limb of a tree. The flames of hell are already lapping at his feet. It would have been better if he had never been born. Eleven remained then, but soon there would be none. Not one friend would stay. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. One would run terrified out of the garden naked, and the rest would follow. Jesus fell on his face in prayer. He tasted the dirt as he fought for the eternal destinies of his eleven sleepy sheep a stone's throw away. Let the cup pass, he cried. Father, if possible, let the cup pass. The father gazed at his son, and the son stared back knowingly. Your will be done, father, whispered the son. And the father held out the cup, and Jesus looked in. What he saw there flung him into the throes of agony. He pressed his forehead deep into the dirt, which softened into mud when mingled with his tears. Jesus felt several small explosions of pain underneath the skin on his face. His tiny capillaries in the sweat glands burst under the stress and blood flowed through his pores and dropped into his eyes, and it stung. Jesus lifted his head to the sky and cried out, I will drink from this cup, Father. I will drink from this cup so that your glory may be vindicated and my name may be glorified, and so that the sheep that you have given me will see our glory and enjoy it forever. I will drink on behalf of our rescue mission. Just then, through blurry eyes, Jesus saw the line of torches slithering like a snake up the hill to the garden. The mob arrived, Judas kissed, friends fled, soldiers arrested, and Jesus' world became a swirl of torment and mockery. His trial was a sham as liars lied and mockers mocked. God claimed to be God, and it was called blasphemy. The face that Moses longed to see the face that he was forbidden to see, was slapped and spit on. More blood in the eyes, more stinging. As he was dragged from the high priest's house, Jesus managed a bloody-eyed glance at Peter. This friend ran from the garden, but this friend followed. And this friend had done the unthinkable three times. This friend denied the friend of friends. This friend denied the friend of sinners. He invoked a curse to lend credence to his denials, and now the cock crowed, and Jesus held Peter in the gaze of eternal love. But Peter looked away and ran. Just outside the city gate, he stumbled and fell to the ground, heaving sobs and considering joining Judas on the tree. But he pleaded to the Father for forgiveness instead, and the Father looked a few hours into the future to Friday afternoon, and, on behalf of what he saw there, he granted Peter the forgiveness he requested. The governor of Judea was up early this cold, gray, wet Friday morning. The city still slept as the priests and soldiers led Jesus to the place of Pontius Pilate. But soon the priests would have a sympathetic crowd as news of Jesus' arrest passed from house to house. They leveled their charges. This man forbids us to pay tribute to Caesar and he calls himself a king. Pilate stared intently at Jesus. He questioned him and found no guilt. Neither did Herod. So Pilate offered to release Jesus to the swelling crowd, but they chose freedom for the murderer Barabbas instead. Then what shall I do with Jesus of Nazareth? Pilate shouted to the mob. They thundered back, crucify him, crucify him. And their voices prevailed. Pilate washed his hands and delivered the innocent one to death. Next, Jesus was stripped and his hands were tied above his head to a post. A large, shirtless Roman legionnaire stepped toward Jesus, fondling a short whip. Several heavy leather thongs hung off the handle, weighed down by the small balls of lead attached near the ends of each. The muscles in the legionnaire's back and arms bulged as he brought down the heavy whip with full force again and again and again across Jesus' shoulders and back and buttocks and legs. The Jews would have been more merciful, no more than 39 lashes, but the Romans extended no such mercy, and the balls of lead yielded large deep bruises. 
Then the bruises were eventually broken open by the endless blows. The thongs cut through the skin, and then they cut deeper into muscles. From behind, Jesus no longer looked human. His skin hung in long, bloody ribbons of tissue. Fearing they had gone too far and killed Jesus before it was time, the soldiers cut him loose. <clears throat> he fell in an unconscious heap at their feet. As Jesus came to, he was forced to stand. A purple robe, not, not his own, was wrapped around him and clung to his open wounds. They made him hold a stick, a mock scepter, and now the king of the Jews needed a crown. One of the Romans picked up a thorn branch from a pile of firewood and braided it into a circle. Never did thorns compose so rich a crown or so painful a crown. Another soldier took the scepter from the hand of the king of kings and beat the crown into his skull. Bloody sweat blinded him, and his stinging eyes momentarily took his mind off the pain in his back. But then the purple robe was torn from Jesus, and ribbons of flesh that adhered to the cloth were ripped off with its removal. Each wound had a voice of its own to shriek its pain, and Jesus collapsed again. Now Jesus is dressed in his own clothes, and before the merciful centurion can move Jesus along, Behind the dark man now carrying the cross, an old woman approaches and wipes Jesus' face with a linen cloth. Jesus looks her in the eyes and then looks to the crowd of weeping women behind her. And he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. The days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. And to the old woman, he adds, if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it's dry? Then Jesus walks on beyond the city gates. It's nine o'clock in the morning, Friday. Through the steady rain, Jesus glances up from the base of a rocky hill. It's named Golgotha, the skull. At the top, he sees several posts fixed in the ground. Three of these poles... <clears throat> stand ready to receive their cross beams and the tattered body of Jesus and the two criminals carrying their crosses behind him. At the top of the hill, the merciful centurion hands Jesus a cup. Jesus sniffs the liquid. It's wine mixed with myrrh, a mild narcotic to dull the pain. But Jesus is meant to feel all the pain, so he hands the cup back. This is not the cup of the Father. A soldier strips Jesus. Again, his back is set on fire, his skin tears away with the cloth. Jesus now lays naked in the dirt. The dark man places the cross beam by Jesus' head. This time Jesus sees his face. It's Simon of Cyrene. Jesus knows him by name and did before there was time. The beam becomes his pillow now. Two men take hold of his hands. The soldier on his left yanks his arm as far as it will go, but the soldier to his right is gentler. Jesus runs to him, turns to him. It's the merciful centurion again. He picks up a cold spike and places it to Jesus' wrist. Then he picks up a hammer. Their eyes meet. Eternal love shines forth again, and the centurion is undone. He looks away and lifts his hammer. In that moment, Jesus hears his own word of power, the word of power that holds the merciful centurion in existence, the word of power that causes the hammer to be. <clears throat> He's speaking it all into being. The soldiers, the priests, the thieves, the friends, the mothers, the brothers, the mob, the wood beams, the spikes, the thorns, the ground beneath <clears throat> him, and the dark crap clouds gathering above. If he ceases to speak, they will all cease to be, but he wills that they remain. So the soldiers live on and the hammers come crashing down. Jesus is lifted on his crossbeam to the post. He sags held only by the spikes in his wrists. Jesus designed the median nerves in his arms that are working perfectly now. The pain shoots up those nerves and explodes in his skull as the crossbeam is set in place. His left foot is now pressed against his right foot 
Both feet are extended, toes down, and a spike is driven through the arch of each. His knees are bent. Jesus immediately pushes himself up to relieve the pain in his outstretched arms. He places his full weight on the spikes in his feet and they tear through the nerves behind the metatarsal bones. Splinters from the post pierce his lacerated back, searing agony. Quickly waves of cramps overtake him, deep throbbing pain from his head to his toes. He is no longer able to push himself up and his knees buckle. He's hanging now by his arms. His pectoral muscles are paralyzed and his intercostals are useless. Jesus can inhale, but he cannot exhale. <clears throat> his compressed heart is struggling to pump blood to his torn tissue. He fights to raise himself in order to breathe and in order to speak. He looks down at the soldiers now gambling for his clothes. He pushes himself up through the violent pain to pray aloud, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Then he sags back into silence, but the crowd is not silent, though he can barely hear their taunts through the din of his pain. He saved others, let him save himself. If you're the Christ, come down off the cross. Save yourself, King of the Jews. The criminal on the cross to his left <clears throat> joins the mockery, but the thief to his right repents. Jesus pushes himself up to say, Truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. It's now noon. The rain falls harder and the clouds blacken. Jesus looks down through the wet strands of hair into the familiar face of a woman. A new pain grips him, greater pain than all the whips and spikes in the kingdom of Rome. It's his mother. She's sobbing so hard that her breathing <clears throat> is as labored as his. Without words, she looks into his eyes and begs to know why. He longs to hold her, to tell her that it's all for her. He pushes up and says, woman. Then he looks his friend John in the eyes. John is standing behind her, supporting his own weeping mother. He is now your son. Then to John, Jesus murmurs, and she is now your mother. Take her away from here. And he sags back into silence back into countless hours of limitless pain. Then Jesus is startled by a foul odor. It isn't the stench of open wounds. It's something else, and it crawls inside him. He looks up to his father. <clears throat> his father looks back, but Jesus doesn't recognize his eyes. They pierce the invisible world with fire and darken the visible sky, and Jesus feels dirty. He hangs between earth and heaven, filthy with human discharge on the outside, and now filthy with human wickedness on the inside. The Father speaks, Son of man, why have you sinned against me and heaped scorn on my great glory? You are a self-sufficient and self-righteous. You're consumed with yourself and puffed up and selfishly ambitious. You rob me of my glory and worship what's inside of you instead of looking out to the one who created you. You are a greedy, lazy, gluttonous, slanderer, and gossip. You are a lying, conceited, ungrateful, cruel adulterer. You practice sexual immorality. You make pornography and fill your mind with vulgarity. You exchange my truth for a lie and worship the creature instead of the creator. And so you are given up to your homosexual passions, dressing immodestly and lusting after what is forbidden. With all your heart, you love perverse pleasure. You hate your brother and murder him with the bullets of anger fired from your own heart. You kill babies for your convenience. You oppress the poor and deal slaves and ignore the needy. You persecute my people. <clears throat> you love money and prestige and honor. You put on a cloak of outward piety, but inside you are filled with dead men's bones. You hypocrite. You are lukewarm and easily enticed by the world. You covet and cannot have, so you murder. You are filled with envy and rage and bitterness and unforgiveness. You blame others for your sin and are too proud to even call it sin. You are never slow to speak, 
and you have a razor tongue that lashes and cuts with its criticism and sinful judgment. Your words do not impart grace. Instead, your mouth is a fountain of condemnation and guilt and obscene talk. You are a false prophet leading people astray. You mock your parents. You have no self-control. You are a betrayer who stirs up division and factions. You are a drunkard and a thief. You are an anxious coward. You do not trust me. You blaspheme against me. You are an unsubmissive wife, and you are a lazy, disengaged husband. You file for divorce and crush the parable of my love for the church. You are a pimp and a drug dealer. You practice divination and worship demons. The list of your sins goes on and on and on, and I hate these things inside of you. I'm filled with disgust and indignation, for your sin consumes me. Now drink my cup. And Jesus does. He drinks for hours. He downs every drop of the scalding liquid of God's own hatred of sin, mingled with his white-hot wrath against that sin. This is the Father's cup. Omnipotent hatred and anger for the sins of every generation past, present, and future. Omnipotent wrath directed at one naked man hanging on a cross. The father can no longer look at his beloved son, his heart's treasure, the mirror image of himself. He looks away. Jesus pushes himself upward and howls to heaven, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Silence. Separation. Jesus whispers, I'm thirsty. And he sags. The merciful centurion soaks a sponge in sour wine and lifts it on a reed to Jesus' lips. And the sour wine is the sweetest drink he ever tasted. Jesus pushes himself up again and cries, It is finished. And it is. Every sin of every child of God has been laid on Jesus, and he drank the cup of God's wrath dry. It's three o'clock Friday afternoon, and Jesus finds one more surge of strength. He presses his torn feet against the spikes, straightens his legs, and with one last gasp of air cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he dies. The merciful centurion sees Jesus' body fall far forward and his head drop low. He thrusts a spear up behind Jesus' ribs, one more piercing for our transgression, and water and blood flow out of his broken heart. In that moment, mountains shake and rocks split, veils tear and tombs open, and the merciful centurion looks up at the lifeless body of Jesus and is filled with awe. He drops to his knees and declares, Truly this man was the Son of God. Mission accomplished. Sacrifice accepted. So I don't know what you think about that, but I found it to be a great blessing to me. Uh, accurate to the biblical story. And... Uh, Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for sacrificing for us. I just want to comment on just a couple of things um, that I thought were just powerful points, uh, powerfully made by this story. The first one is that we see the kindness and love of Jesus on display. I think we see it especially toward the, you know, the merciful centurion, the, the looks that Jesus gave him, the love that Jesus uh, showed him, even as that centurion led um, Jesus to his eventual death, even as the centurion was one that put one of the spikes in his wrists, according to you know Rick's rendering. Um, we see the love of Christ. We see the love that he showed uh, toward Simon of Cyrene. We see the love that he showed toward his mother. <laughs> And we see the love that he uh, even showed his executioners and, and mockers. You know, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Second thing that I think the story brings out powerfully is, is the, the power that Jesus withheld. 
um, Jesus was fully God and Jesus was, was fully man. He chose not to exercise the power that he had as God. And, and I think that it's powerfully brought out in the story. Uh, Colossians 1 says of Jesus that all things were created by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus, and that Jesus was before all things, and that in Jesus all things hold together. Hebrews 1, 2, and 3 echoes what Colossians 1 says about Jesus. Hebrews 1 says, Through Jesus the world was created, and Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. And so all things were created by Jesus, for Jesus. And not only that, but Jesus is upholding the world, upholding the universe by the word of his power. That's how powerful uh, Jesus was, the one who was crucified. He chose not to exercise that power. And I think uh, Pastor Rick brings that out so powerfully in this piece where he says, In that moment, Jesus hears his own word of power. The word of power that holds the merciful centurion in existence. The word of power that causes the hammer to be. He's speaking it all into being. The soldiers, the priests, the thieves, the friends, the mothers, the brothers, the mob, the wooden beams, the spikes, the thorns, the ground beneath him, and the dark clouds gathering above. If he ceases to speak, they all cease to be. But he wills that they remain. So the soldiers live on. And the hammers come crashing down. What a powerful picture of, of the power of Jesus withheld for, for our sake and for the sake of all who would trust in him. A third thing that I think Rick powerfully brings out is the, the pain that, that Christ endured. I, I think he chronicles so well the, the physical pain of the cross, the details of that, which you don't find in the Gospels, it just says that Jesus was crucified. The details aren't there, but we know from, from history um, about crucifixion and what it entailed physically, and I, I think that's brought out powerfully. But, but the other thing that happened on the cross, according to the Bible, is that Jesus became sin for us. He took our sin on himself. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake... God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And, and to me, that's the most powerful part of the story is this, this portion where Jesus is startled by this foul odor, that it crawls inside of him, that he looks back to the Father and doesn't recognize his eyes, that Jesus feels dirty, and he says that Jesus hangs between earth and heaven, filthy with human discharge on the outside and now filthy with human wickedness on the inside. And then the Father speaks, Son of Man. He addresses Jesus just as Jesus, you know, prophetically addressed himself throughout his life here on earth. Son of Man, talking to Jesus, why have you sinned against me and heaped scorn on my Glory, And so we have this picture of the Father addressing the Son as a sinner. And we go through this long, just super powerful list of, of, of sins, you know, many of which are coming right out of you know, places like Romans 1 and others. Um, at the end of the section it says, The list of your sins, Jesus, goes on and on and on and I hate these things inside of you. I'm filled with disgust and indignation for you. your sin consumes me. Now drink my cup. And then he says, and Jesus does. He drinks for hours. He downs every drop of the scalding liquid of God's own hatred of sin mingled with his white hot wrath against that sin. This is the Father's cup. That's the cup. I think, I think he's right. Pastor Rick is right. That's the cup that Jesus feared in the Garden of Gethsemane that he asked three times uh, the Father to take away from him. It's not so much the physical pain that Jesus feared. It was that separation. It was that taking on of our sin. 
It was that wrath of God poured out on him because of, of our sin that he took on himself. I think that's what Jesus feared the most. And I think it's just so vividly and powerfully brought out here, the way that Pastor Rick puts it. I just think it's great. Um, it says, uh, he downs every drop of the scalding liquid of God's own hatred of sin mingled with his white hot wrath against the sin. This is the Father's cup. Omnipotent hatred and anger for the sins of every generation past, present, and future. So it, it was my sins, past, present, future. You know, if you've trusted in Christ, it was your sins, past, present, future. It was Moses' sins, past, present, future. It's, you know, generations in the future's sins, past, present, future. Anybody who trusts in Christ, all of those sins heaped on Jesus' shoulders 2,000 years ago, and the wrath of God poured out on Jesus for those sins. That's what happened at the cross. That's what he did for us. The father can no longer look at his beloved son, his heart's treasure, the mere image of himself. He looks away, silence, separation. Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Powerful. Uh, 1 John 1, excuse me, 2, 1 and 2 says this. My children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Propitiation means wrath bearer. And that's what Jesus did. He bore the wrath of God. He was our propitiation 2,000 years ago. And if you trust in him, uh, you'll never have to endure the wrath that he endured um, on your behalf. Fourthly, finally, uh, I think that Rick brings out the victory that Christ accomplished. It's brief says, Jesus pushes himself up again and cries, it is finished. And it is. Every sin of every child of God has been laid on Jesus and he drank the cup of God's wrath dry. 1 Peter 3.18 says, Christ died for sin once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. When Jesus said, it is finished, he meant that he bore the wrath. He paid the penalty. Um, the father was satisfied by the punishment that, that Jesus took for sin on our, our behalf. It is finished. And so if you've trusted in Christ again, um, it is finished. You don't have to bear the wrath of that sin because Jesus already bore it for you. And so with that, we want to move to a, a time of repentance. And again, if we had that wooden cross, if we were together, we would be nailing these sins to the cross. And, and, and that idea comes from Colossians 2, 13 and 14, uh, where the Apostle Paul says this, and you, that's me, that's you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive with him, with Christ, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Okay, we were dead in the, the uncircumcision of our flesh. We were dead in the flesh without Christ, but God made us alive together with Christ. He forgave us of all of our trespasses. How did he do it? He, by, he canceled the record of debt. Um, how did he do it? By nailing it to the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, when Jesus was nailed to the cross, he took our sins on, all of our sins were forgiven, all of them, all our trespasses. The record of death that stood against us, the death penalty, the penalty of hell that stood against us for our sin was canceled along with all its legal demands. 
It was all set aside. It was nailed to the cross, put away forever. And so what we want to do right now is, is I want you, and I'm going to do the same, to think about, you know, what are your debts? What are your trespasses? We had that great paragraph and list of, of, of sins that were, you know, Jesus paid for on our behalf. Which, which one of those do you own? Which one of those are you guilty of? You know, whether it be in the past or whether it be right now. And what I want you to do is just take that piece of paper, take that pencil, take that pen, stop the recording, and take a few minutes just to write those things down. And then I'm going to tell you what we'll do with it next. Do that now. Okay. So if we were together, we would now walk up to the cross and we would nail that piece of paper full of our sins to the cross as a reminder that Jesus paid it all. He paid for every one of those sins, every single one of them, no matter how big, no matter how many, no matter how persistent, Jesus paid for it. It's finished. It's done. Um, all of your trespasses and the, the record of the debt that stands against you because of them is canceled because of what he did for you on the cross. And so you don't have to um, hold those sins over your head anymore because Jesus doesn't. The Bible says that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive those sins and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. So I just want to encourage you. Those sins are paid for. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, if you're believing what he did for you on the cross, that he paid that penalty for your sins, then those sins are done. God will never hold those against you ever again. And the same goes for any future sins that you're going to commit. They were all paid for already by Jesus Christ. And so I want you to rejoice in that. Praise the Lord for what Jesus did for us on Good Friday. Praise the Lord for Jesus Christ. Okay. So what I want to close with, I'm going to pray, but I want to set up what's going to happen last here. We're going to sing a song called Man of Sorrows. And this is a song by Hillsong Worship. And it goes like this. Now my debt is paid. It is paid in full by the precious blood of that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the sun sets free. Oh, he's free indeed. And I just want you, as, as we, we sing these words together, or you just listen to the words, close your eyes and listen as Dan, you know, plays and sings, just to, just to praise the Lord, just to take these, you know, words in, take these truths in, let them just touch and invade and bless your heart. Um, and I just want to add, too, that if, if you're somebody that for whom this is new, you didn't know some of these things, you've not heard this gospel, um, I just want to encourage you, uh, give your life to Christ now. I mean, uh, ask him to forgive you of your sins, and he will. Ask you to come into your uh, life, and he will. Um, turn your life over to him. He, he will lead you. He will guide you. He will bless you. I think of Tracy Charlton, who last year came to the uh, Good Friday service and, and gave her life to Jesus Christ. And uh, you can do the same tonight if you're in that spot. And so I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to turn it over to Dan, and uh, let's enjoy and praise Jesus as we uh, think about and sing this last song together. Jesus, we're amazed by your grace. We're amazed by your mercy. We're so thankful for Good Friday and for the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. God, thank you for becoming the propitiation for our sins. Thank you for being our wrath bearer. And, uh, and we just are so grateful to you tonight. And I just pray for just a continued appreciation um, of you and of your sacrifice as we close our service in song 
and as we move toward your resurrection on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Hey everybody, Pastor Eric here, just one more time. Um, I hope you were blessed by the service. I wanted to just realize that I made two mistakes in the service that I wanted to mention. First of all, Tracy Charlton actually came to the Lord two Good Fridays ago, so it was two years ago uh, on Good Friday. Trace, apologize for the mix up there. Uh, I just got that wrong, forgot that. And then secondly, I forgot to tell you what to do with those pieces of paper. You can rip those up. Um, some of you probably already realize that you can burn those up. Uh, I think that's a great symbolic reminder of the fact that that when those sins are nailed to the cross, they're they're done. They're they're behind us. Uh, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. He's buried him in the bottom of the sea. They're they are done for. Uh, it is finished. So rip those things up into a million pieces. Um, burn them up if you want. Uh, they're nailed to the cross. Sorry for having forgot that. God bless you, and hopefully we'll see you on Sunday.